The top 10 best weapons lists are coming to an end. This is going to be the last one. We have actually covered all the other Souls games. We have actually done top 10 Elden Ring weapons that can be infused. And today we are going to go over the ones that cannot be infused. The special ones, the unique weapons, the somber weapons, whatever you want to call them, we're going to do those today. Now I say this in every other video, but I'm just going to say it again. I can only pick 10. There are 10 slots. That's it. There are so many amazing weapons in these games. This one especially, there's probably like at least 50 ST weapons alone. So there's going to be really good stuff that just doesn't make it to the list. So if you have your own opinions, just let me know down in the comments. Now I just want to talk about something real quick before I do get started because I can already tell what the comment section is going to be like. Yes, there's going to be lots of weapon skill spam. We're going to spam the L2 button a whole bunch. And the reason for that is because that is literally the meta. That is the best way to beat the game whether we like it or not. L2 spam is just the way to go. It fucks up everything in the entire game and it makes it incredibly good. So if you're a person that's clicked on a top 10 best weapons video, you're going to learn about the meta. We're going to talk about the most efficient method possible to beat the game and talk about the best of the best. That is that is why we're here. Now, yes, there are going to be cases where like there is more to a weapon than its weapon skill. But for the most part, the things that differentiate these weapons are going to be their skills. Because a lot of the movesets in these games tend to be very similar. So there's no point about talking about the movesets being that they're just going to be the exact same things anyway. The things that differentiate these weapons will be their scalings and their weapon skills, of which I'm going to talk about those ones for the most part. Anyway, let's just get started. Started. Starting off at number 10, we have the Ordovis' Greatsword. Now, this is a strength faith based greatsword, of which you're probably just better off going all into strength because its faith scaling is not going to be anywhere near as good. You're not going to really benefit until you get to about like 80 strength, and then you can put a little bit of points into faith. Unless you do want to use spells, then I recommend just specking into a little bit of faith beforehand. Now, yes, this actually is going to be doing split holy damage, which, yes, is the worst damage type in the entire game. It can be viable but it is just the worst one. But the good thing about this weapon is that it mainly does physical damage. And with the A scaling that it gets in strength, you can just go all into that stat and like 80% of your damage is going to be coming off physical damage. Now, in terms of the moveset, it is just a regular greatsword moveset, which is still pretty nice, relatively quick, good variation. But the weapon skill is where it's at in Ordovus's Vortex. This weapon skill for only 15 FP does this pretty cool short range AOE attack. When uncharged, the damage isn't that high, does do 30 stance damage, which is like relatively the same amount as a heavy attack. But when this thing is fully charged, that is where it definitely does shine. I just recommend just fully charging it almost all the time. Now, yes, it is still going to be a shorter range AOE and it is going to be a longer animation. But the good thing about it is that you have a lot of hype armor. So you actually can tank a whole bunch of attacks throughout the animation itself, to which it's very unlikely that you do get interrupted when using the attack. But when this thing is fully charged, it just does so much damage. It hits like multiple times. It can flatten smaller enemies to the ground. And when paired alongside the Godfrey's icon, it could do 15% more damage. But the most crazy thing about this, it does 82 stance damage. Almost every single boss in the entire game can just be stance broken in like just two fully charged attacks. And for only consuming 15 FP, it is just utterly ridiculous. And you can pair this alongside the stone barbed crack tier to just push it over 100 stance damage, of which you could just stance break most enemies in the game in just one attack. Now, the only downsides I really can say about this weapon is that it still is going to be a shorter range weapon skill that does have a longer animation. So you are going to get hit a whole bunch when you do use this weapon skill. And the split holy damage that it does get isn't really helping much. And its faith scaling isn't that crazy as well, only at C scaling and faith. But its weapon skill is more than good enough to make up for it. And it kind of just serves as like an AoE version of the Marius Executioner Sword, but just does more stance damage. And it's easier to set up, so this one actually just might be the better option, honestly. Number 9, we have the Bolt of Grand Sacks. Now, this is a strength and dexterity based spear. Does scale a lot better off that dexterity stat, and its weapon skill does purely scale off that as well. So, you're just best going all into dexterity. Now, this actually does get some split lightning damage and some piercing damage, which are two of the best damage types in the entire game. Now, that piercing damage is obviously going to come because it is a spear, which these weapons are absolutely amazing because you just get quick poking attacks. Poking attacks are always going to be really good because they just maximize your range. Now, the unfortunate thing is that you just get the regular spear moveset, so that means you just get a bunch of just poking attacks you don't really get much variety don't get those horizontal swipes outside of the rolling and crouching attack so trying to hit multiple enemies at once or trying to hit skinnier types of enemies might serve as somewhat of a problem but thankfully this weapon actually does get the second most range out of all the spears meaning they actually can hit at further distances and speaking of which, the weapon skill Ancient Lightning Spear is probably going to be like the best sniper in the entire game. For 25 FP, you get a pretty solid lightning projectile attack. Now the uncharged version isn't anything too crazy. It does go pretty far, does travel quickly. The casting time is not that long, but the fully charged version is where it's going to be at because it just travels so much faster, 
goes way further and actually does knock enemies back and just send them flying. And then paired alongside the Godfrey's icon and some like lightning types of buffs, you can just do absolutely incredible damage. And the fact that it's doing pure lightning damage is amazing because a lot of enemies are very weak to lightning and hardly any are actually resist to it. Most of the enemies that do resist it are we like your ancient dragons and like some dragons in general, of which this weapon actually does do boosted damage against dragons and ancient dragons. So it does counteract Proby's one weakness. But yeah, this thing can just serve as an absolute cheese machine. You just sit at the back of the map and just keep spamming your sniper and just pick enemies off at a distance. They won't even aggro towards you. By the time they probably end up reaching your location, they're probably already dead. Now some downsides that I do have with this weapon is that one, it is just going to be pure dexterity based. So it's not gonna have much synergy with spells because there's no like dexterity based seal or stuff. I don't know why the gravel stone seal wasn't like a dexterity based seal. Hopefully we do get one in the DLC somewhat of like an equivalence to the claw mark seal. Also the fact that you only get one per playthrough can be kind of annoying because power extensing spears is definitely where it's going to be at. And also the requirements can be kind of high at 40 dexterity and 20 strength. But by the time you actually do get this weapon, you're still gonna be perfectly fine. And it's not like you really need spells anyway because this thing is probably better than most spells in the game. Number eight, we have the Envoy's Longhorn. Now this is a strength and faith based Great Hammer, of which Great Hammers are just going to be an amazing weapon class. They can stagger very nicely, have pretty quick move sets. You get good variety in terms of like horizontal, vertical swipes. The power sensing combo is pretty good too. And actually does get amazing stance damage. Its charge heavy tax actually does get the highest amount of stance damage in the entire game, even more so than colossal weapons. Now the Envoy's Longhorn, yes, is going to be doing holy damage, which yes, once again, is actually the worst damage type in the entire game. And it kind of isn't even close. But with the Envoy's Longhorn, it doesn't even matter. And just to prove this point, all the gameplay you're going to be seeing against the enemies and bosses are all resist to holy damage, some even 80% resist. Because with its weapon skill, Bubble Shower, for only 16 FP, 16 FP, you just absolutely decimate bosses. It just shreds their entire health bar. Now everyone knows that it actually does perform extremely well against larger types of bosses, because the bubbles will just hit multiple times and just end up doing ridiculous amounts of damage. But even against smaller types of enemies, it still performs nicely. Like even the Elden Beast, this guy's 80% resist to holy damage and he's still taking a bunch away. Now I'm not stating this stuff as a defense to holy damage. I still think that holy damage should just be way better than what it actually is. If the Envoy's Longhorn was just doing magic or lightning damage instead, it would just be twice as good. But I just wanna let you guys know that it's still really good even against bosses that are resist to it. But even outside of the amazing damage that it actually does get, it still gets insane stance damage as well. If every single one of those bubbles hit, it can do upwards of 90 stance damage. Now, most bosses aren't going to be big enough to get hit by every single bubble. So actually will take a couple of attempts to actually end up stance breaking. But the fact that it actually can do that much kind of borderlines on the overpowered section. Now, I guess the trade-off for that is kind of that you have like a longer animation to actually cast the bubbles. You have to like be stationary, sit down and do this bubble blowing animation. But for only 16 FP, you can't really go wrong. Number seven, we have the Bloodhound's Fang, which this is a strength and dexterity based curved greatsword. And curved greatswords are amazing weapons that get really fast movesets, get very solid range, decent poise damage. And with the Bloodhound's Fang, this is definitely going to be the best of the bunch. Now I actually did have this weapon initially like higher on my list, like around about number four and number five, but it slid down just a little bit for reasons I actually will get into. But to talk about the positives outside of the fact that it is a curved greatsword, this thing actually does get some of the most range out of the entire class. It gets some of the highest damage too. This going into like a bunch of strength and dexterity can just make it do way more damage than all the other curved greatswords. And on top of that, you actually can buff it and it actually gets bleed. So you can either just double down into that bleed with blood flame blade and just make it proc bleed really fast and do amazing damage. Or you can just pair it alongside an actual higher damaging type of weapon buff to just make it do even more damage. The weapon also gets more jumping attack damage compared to all the other curved greatswords. For whatever reason, its motion values for jumping attacks are just a lot higher compared to the rest. So if you're just gonna use jumping attacks, it's just going to be even better than what it should have been. And its weapon skill, Bloodhound's Finesse, is also incredible. For 8 FP, you do this quick attack that actually can be pretty high damaging, doesn't have much range, but you actually do get the option of a follow-up attack for an additional 12 FP that actually does serve as an iframe dodge that actually ends up doing an even higher damaging attack. And this can just end up just melting bosses. And on top of all of that, it actually does 44 stance damage in total. 44 stance damage for a high damaging weapon skill that only consumes 20 FP. And you could probably do a bunch of blood loss put up alongside with it. And getting an iframe dodge as well. Like it's just amazing. And probably best of all yet, you actually get it right at the beginning of the game. Like in the first area, all you're gonna do is kill like a pretty easy boss and then you have it acquired, that's it. Now as for these weapons downsides, they're kind of really isn't any. I'm just gonna have to like nitpick and compare it to the rest of the weapons on this list. And that typically the game is just so much easier if you just have projectile attacks. Projectiles just cheese so much of the game because you don't even have to be in melee range and have to dodge attacks for the most part. You're gonna sit at a distance and just pick enemies off and just do amazing damage that way. Of which the Bloodhouse Finesse 
is this going to be melee based? You can't really just sit at a safer distance to just do damage, which is like a very small complaint, but if we're comparing the best of the best, we're gonna have to talk about it. And the fact that it just gets a strength and dexterity based scaling means that you can't really pair it alongside a faith or an intelligence based build, which spells in this game are going to be incredible because as I mentioned, projectiles are just going to be amazing and this, this build is not gonna really gonna have much synergy with that. And it can mean that you actually miss out on a whole bunch of potential buffs or debuffs. But yeah, like it's such a small little downside. If you don't really care to use spells or projectiles at all, this is probably going to be the best weapon in the entire game. Number six, we have the Wing of Astel, which is a dexterity and intelligence based curved sword. Now curved swords are an amazing weapon class, very quick attacks, high DPS, the power sensing movesets are absolutely amazing. They typically don't stagger well or get high stance damage and the variety in movesets tend to be pretty poor. But the Wing of Astel just says like, fuck you to all of that. And any downside that the curved sword actually does have the Wing of Estelle just counteracts that tenfold because the Wing of Estelle is literally the best stance breaking weapon in the entire game. And honestly, it's kind of not even close. Like this thing is just that good. Like how is a curve sword gonna be the best poise breaking or stance breaking weapon in the entire game? Don't know how that happens, but it, it just did, okay? But to start off with the fact that its heavy attack is going to be a projectile, which means that you get a free projectile attack, which obviously is going to be amazing by itself. But when you have it fully charged, curve swords do a double swing. So basically it just turns into like a double projectile attack. And the best part about it, it does insanely high stance damage. It does 52 stance damage, which is about the exact same as a charge attack of a colossal weapon. And it doesn't just end there. It's a weapon skill Nebula. It literally just does more stance damage than that. This thing for only 20 FP has a pretty quick casting AOE attack that goes on a nice horizontal spread, can hit like multiple enemies at once very consistently. And it explodes like five to six times. And every single one of those explosions can do 13 stance damage. Meaning if all those projectiles hit, you can do upwards of like 60 stance damage. And for only 20 FP and that fast of an animation, and being that it has like a delayed attack, you can just combine it with the charged heavy attack that you get. And you're doing easily over hundred stance damage at a distance for only 20 FP in like a second or two, it's actually broken. And it's not like it's damage is like compromised as a trade-off. The damage is actually still pretty good. You get a decent dexterity and intelligence scaling. Going all into that intelligence, that could mean that you actually get some decent attacks with your light attacks if you wanted to use the light attacks. Not that you really have much of an incentive to do so, being that your weapon skill and heavy attack are just so stupid. And this weapon also does get the added benefit of just doing more damage against gravity type of enemies, which doesn't involve many enemies, but the fact that you just can do more against those types of bosses is just going to be really good. And the weapon skill also does get boosted by the spell blade set to just further enhance the damage by about additional 10%. So yeah, like there's nothing really bad about this weapon. I think like the only downside I could potentially say is that the projectiles don't really have that much range. So you still have to be closer towards your enemy to actually like, you know, do that really good damage, but it's still going to be one of the best weapons in the entire game. Number five, we have the Death's Poker, which is another dexterity and intelligence based weapon. This one actually being a great sword and actually does get some passive Frostbite as well. Now Frostbite is gonna be one of the best status effects in the entire game because it does deal 10% chunk damage and makes enemies take 20% more damage throughout its duration. Now this weapon actually does get the regular greatsword moveset, except for its heavy attack, actually does get a little upward cut, and when fully charged, does this little bit of a running animation, which can be kind of cool, has some nice range. Now in terms of its scalings, it actually does get a descaling in intelligence, which might seem pretty shit, but that descaling is actually better than what it actually does suggest, because they still get a decent amount of returns when specking into that stat, which is especially good because its weapon skill actually does a scale of intelligence, which Ghost Flame Ignition is definitely going to be the best part about this weapon. For 15 FP, you summon this little ghost flame ball, which when enemies are standing inside of it or next to it, that is going to take a bunch of frostbite over time and a bunch of damage in general. But the good thing about this is that you actually can do a follow-up input as well. The light attack will actually throw out this fire projectile on the ground and the heavy attack will actually do this explosion. Now the fire trail that's left on the ground, the light attack version is going to be a much better in my opinion. It is going to result in much more damage because that trail just kind of stays there for a long time and it procs frost extremely extremely quickly. If enemies are standing on it for like a second, so that it's instantly gonna get it procced with frostbite. The heavy attack explosion, I kind of only really use when you wanna like send enemies flying. So if you're going up against like smaller enemies or if you're surrounded by a bunch of them, it can be pretty cool and it is fun to use as well. Now, despite it actually having a fire effect, it still is going to do pure magic damage and the damage itself is just through the roof. Like you can just melt enemies so quickly. The projectile actually does go relatively far. And if enemies are just standing inside of that thing, they're just gonna get melted. And you can also pair this alongside the spell blade set to just further enhance the damage, get on the magic tier, intelligence tier, magic scorpion charm, and you're just doing so much damage and you can make quick work of almost every single boss in the entire game because not many enemies in this game are actually resist to magic. The only downside that I can really say about this weapon skill is that it doesn't get much stance damage. You're not gonna really poise break with this thing at all. And the animation can be somewhat long. So if you're trying to use that at point blank range, you might get interrupted a whole bunch because it doesn't get high armor. But if you have your positioning and spacing correct, just use that at a distance and enemies will just get destroyed.
Number four, we have the Sword of Night and Flame. Now, how is a Sword of Night and Flame gonna get in the top five in patch 1.1? In this day and age, are you really gonna put the Sword of Night and Flame in the top five? Yes, I am. This thing was always gonna get in the top 10. A couple days ago, I just did another playthrough with this weapon, just to make sure, just to see if I was wrong. Nope, it's still amazing, and it definitely solidified a top five spot for me. I killed all the Great Rune bosses. The playthrough took about like three hours. It was not even that long. You can go check the run out on my YouTube channel or on Twitch. Basically, all the gameplay you're seeing right now is from that playthrough, so I'm not even that high of a level in this gameplay. But to talk about the weapon itself, it is a straight sword, but straight swords are pretty solid. They get some of the best variation in moveset, pretty quick attacks. You can't really go wrong. Now this weapon actually does get split damage, but in three different damage types, physical, magic, and fire, because split damage is not great. You have to go through multiple different defenses, but thankfully this weapon actually does get pretty good scalings. You get a B scaling in both intelligence and faith, which means that split damage isn't going to be that bad. But the fact that this is the only faith intelligence weapon in the entire game is enough reason to put it into the S tier. The fact that there isn't any other one makes it very unique. Even if it was shit, which it's definitely not, it would still be very useful. Now I know people are probably gonna talk about the Clayman's Harpoon or the Erdsteel Dagger, but those things are hardly even faith into weapons because they're only gonna like a de-skilling in one of those stats. So yeah, the Sword of Night and Flame is basically the only one. Now, a lot of people always end up saying to the spec into one or the other, either faith or intelligence, and just go use one part of the weapon skill, because the weapon skill is basically either a magic projectile attack or a fire projectile attack. The magic one, scaling off intelligence, and the fire one, scaling of faith. So going all into one, would just mean you're gonna get more damage, which I'm kind of half on that take, because I definitely recommend that you just spec into both faith and intelligence, because you're gonna get access to both sorceries and incantations, which means you can actually use the buffs for both of those things. And doing different types of elemental damage in one weapon is very beneficial because if you go up against an enemy that's weaker to fire, you can use a fire version. Go up against an enemy that's weaker to magic, you can use the magic version. You don't even need that much stat investment in a particular stat to actually get good damage. In the gameplay that you're seeing, I'm actually like split even in both. Probably around about 30 something faith and intelligence. Now the way I actually would use it is that when you go up against a particular boss, I will just commit to using the one and use the buffs that boost that particular thing. So if you go up against an enemy that's weaker to fire damage, I'll just use the fire based one, go into faith tier, the fire tier, fire scorpion charm, flame gummy strength, things like that. And against every other boss that's not weaker to fire damage, I will just use the magic based version because the magic one can just perform a lot better. Not only because it's cheaper, consuming 26 FP compared to 32 FP, but it can just do way more damage and go further because this thing actually can get boosted by Terra Magica, which is 35% more damage, Magic Tier, Magic Scorpion Charm, Intelligence Tier, but it also can get boosted by the Spellblade set. And being they actually going into a faith-based build, you can also use Howler Shibri and Golden Vow. And all of these things together could just result in the most absurd amounts of damage. And it could easily like two or even three shot most bosses in this game. You don't even need to even use these buffs, but if you really want it to be broken and overpowered, you can. But I guess that's kind of like the only downside is that you're gonna have to like just have a lot of preparation and get a bunch of items just to really boost the damage. But it's still not that big of a deal because all you gotta do is like one person's quest line, kill a couple of Erd Tree avatars and grab some crystal tears, which you all get pretty early in the game anyway. But the trade-off for that is that you're gonna have a faith and intelligence based weapon and do amazing damage, which having a faith and intelligence based weapon is really good because you have synergy with both incantations and sorceries and specifically with incantations because you have the golden order seal, which is literally the highest damaging seal in the entire game. And that's for like early game, mid game, late game. It performs extremely well. So if you actually do want to use even more damage types like lightning or holy damage, you can go ahead and use that seal. Now, unfortunately the staffs, I can't really say the same thing. The Gelmir staff and the Prince of the Death staff aren't too good. The Prince of the Death staff does perform like the best honestly, but only at like extremely high levels, like at AD intelligence and faith. But honestly, you don't even need to use any types of like damaging sorceries if your projectile attack that you get with the weapon itself is this good. As long as you just use Terra Magica, then you're fine. Terra Magica is the only one that you really need and that doesn't even require you to upgrade your stuff. And also one other thing I do wanna mention is that it actually does have pretty good interaction with Frostbite because typically when you proc frost on something, you wouldn't want to reset it and take it away, which you actually can do with fire because when you take it away, it loses the debuff. But this thing, for some reason with its light attack combo, it doesn't actually get rid of the frostbite, even though it is doing a bit of fire damage, which is kind of cool. Now, yes, using the fire-based weapon skill is going to remove the frost, but that is a small little thing I thought to mention. But yeah, overall, this is definitely deserving of a top five weapon. Number three, we have the Mogwin's Sacred Spear. Now this bad boy is a great spear that gets a strength and arcane based scaling. Now great spears are gonna be one of the better weapon classes in the entire game because obviously you get access to piercing type damage. You get a bunch of really good poking attacks. You get extremely high stance damage too. It's really good power stance. You can pair it alongside a shield and attack and block at the same time. And with the Mogwin's Sacred Spear in particular, this one actually gets the most amount of range out of all the rest of the great spears. And if that wasn't enough for its base kit, it actually does get to bleed too. And being that actually scales best with arcane, just going all into that arcane stat is just going to result in even more blood loss build up. So just with all those things alone, it already makes for one of the best weapons in the entire game, but 
its weapon skill, Blood Boon Ritual, is just downright ridiculous. This thing for 20 FP rains down a bunch of blood from the sky in this like massive AoE attack that like hits on like 360 degree radius. It doesn't go like that far, but it goes far enough to where you can just like melt all enemies surrounding you. And this attack not only does stupid amounts of damage, but it also procs bleed so quickly. And you also get a follow-up attack and an additional follow-up attack. Now the entire combo is going to consume 60 FP and it actually is a pretty long animation, which can be somewhat of a downside, especially if you're fighting enemies that can't be bled out or can't really be staggered by the attack itself. Of which in that instance, it's probably not going to be that good to have, but it still does enough damage. You still get a decent amount of hyper armor and you do proc bleed pretty quickly to where like in 95% of the game, it's going to be just broken and overpowered to have. Unless you're fighting those bosses that are very resistant to fire damage. But obviously this thing is going to shine best against those smaller types of enemies. If you're in a dungeon and you get surrounded by a bunch of just mobs, you just click the button one time and they just all get deleted against any type of boss that actually can get staggered pretty easily, like Millennia, they're just going to get destroyed. And the fact that it actually gets such a good arcane scaling, you can just go all into that stat, pair it alongside the dragon communion seal, and then you have a bunch of really good incantations because this seal still gets very high incant scaling. So this thing basically just gets everything. You get amazing bleed, good poise damage, good synergy with spells, really good range, very solid for AoE. It's just amazing. Number two, we have the Dark Moon Greatsword, which I think this is the best weapon in the entire game in terms of performance. If you're a person that's like, you know, somewhat familiar with the mechanics and you know how to dodge pretty well, and you just want to like, you know, just cheese and just destroy bosses pretty easily, this is the one for you. This is the one. This bad boy is an intelligence-based greatsword, of which does get some frostbite buildup, of which I have already talked about frost being an amazing status effect to have, but its weapon skill, Moonlight's Greatsword, is going to buff its weapon with even more magic damage and even more frost buildup, but it also does turn its heavy attacks into a projectile, which that basically means that it doesn't consume any FP at all. And these projectile attacks do insane damage. It's tied to your heavy, so it actually can be fully charged as well. You can pair that alongside Godfrey's icon to just make it do even more damage. It does ridiculous frost build up. It's very fast. It goes relatively far and it does like 35 stance damage. Like how are you going to do 35 stance damage without consuming any FP at a distance and do it that fast while also proccing frost very quickly? And basically it's like the only weapon skill in the entire game of which actually can be paired alongside the jellyfish shield. Because being that the projectile is tied to your heavy attack, you don't have to click the L2 button much, meaning that you can just put on the jellyfish shield, use that, and that's going to be 20% more damage. You're going to stack so many buffs with this thing that it can just cheese every single boss in the entire game, even if they resist to frost damage, even if they're just immune to it. Even if they resist to magic damage, it still doesn't matter. Which isn't really many enemies in the game that are resist to magic damage. And obviously this thing gets a B scaling and intelligence, so it pairs nicely with like a sorcery build because you don't really need much strength or dexterity. Not that you really need to use spells because this projectile is better than like almost every spell in the entire game because it does that much damage. But yeah, I think this is definitely a top two weapon in this game. Number one and number two, definitively. But for number one, obviously we're going to go with a Blasphemous Blade. Every single time that I make a list, it's always the same three suspects. Blasphemous Blade, Darkwing Greatsword, Mogwin Sacred Spear. They're just like built different. And for the Blasphemous Blade, it's probably not going to be as like high damaging compared to the Darkwing Greatsword or the Mogwin Sacred Spear. But in terms of its ease of use and the benefits that it actually does do, especially for like newer players, this is just unrivaled. To start off with, this is going to be a Greatsword that actually does get some split fire damage, which fire damage can be pretty decent. A lot of enemies are pretty weak to it, but there are a bunch that are resist to it as well, especially when it actually does rain or when there is water around. But the Blasphemous Blade, it still does not matter because it gets ridiculously high AR. You you get such a good faith and strength based scaling that you can just result in such high amounts of damage. Now it does just get the basic greatsword moveset, which is not bad at all. The greatsword moveset is still very solid, but this weapon is going to shine with its weapon skill, Taker's Flame, which for 30 FP, you shoot out this like massive projectile that goes insanely far, goes through enemies, knocks enemies back and sends them flying, does a bunch of damage. And on top of all of that, it heals you. You get health back and it's a decent chunk of health. You get like 10% plus 150 HP health back every single time that you hit with it. And if you actually get a kill, it gives you even more health back. And that's not even just with the weapon skill. If you just kill the weapon itself, it just gives you health back. You don't even have to kill the weapon. You can just have it equipped and kill with something else and you get health back. So purely based on ease of use, this is just going to be the best weapon in the entire game. Now in terms of the Blasphemous Blade downsides, as I did mention, it's not going to be like as high as damaging as like the Darkman Greatsword, Mogwin Sacred Spear or the Sword of Night and Flame, but it still does more than enough damage. And it does do that fire damage, which once again, a lot of enemies are resist to it. And when there's like water around, when it's raining it can be pretty shit but it actually does get a very good faith scaling so you pair it alongside some incantations use lightning based spells physical spells or holy spells and you'll be perfectly fine so yes the blasphemous blade is going to be the best weapon in the entire game anyway that is it that is the video as always please let me know what your opinions are down in the comments below and please do like and subscribe because i do have a whole bunch more videos coming along the way anyway catch you guys around bye